Today's episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, an incredible and incredibly affordable place to watch thousands of non-fiction movies and shows. More on them in a bit. It was perhaps the most dramatic birth this channel will ever cover. In January 2004, a bright spot of light streaked across the skies of Arabia Terra, the burning ball of fire slicing through the atmosphere at over 16,000 kilometers per hour, far above the empty desert wastes. But this was no ordinary shooting star, and this was no ordinary desert. And inside the fireball was one of the most advanced pieces of kit ever created, a rover designed to shatter science records. Its destination, the frozen, windswept plains of the planet Mars. If the rover survived its traumatic birth, the plan was to have it live in this hostile environment for up to 90 Martian days, 90 days in which it would travel perhaps one kilometer from its landing site, conducting science experiments along the way. Instead, Opportunity would remain active on the surface of Mars for a staggering 14 and a half years. In today's experimental episode of Biographics, we're delving into the life of not a man or a woman, but a machine. A robot that traveled to our celestial neighbor, and in doing so, opened humanity's eyes to the wonders of our solar system. Normally when making these biographies, we open, unsurprisingly, with the subject's birth. But that's just not going to work with Opportunity. By NASA's definition, the rover was born when it emerged from its protective cocoon shortly after impacting the surface of Mars on January the 25th, 2004. But starting our video there would miss half the story. No, with this particular subject, we're going to have to rewrite the rules by opening way way back. Back before Opportunity was even just a twinkle in NASA's eye. Back in an era when Mars exploration more often than not meant gigantic, really expensive screw-ups. The path that led to Opportunity, affectionately known as Oppy, roving around the Martian surface and charming us all, can be said to have begun on an utterly miserable day back in 1993. That day, everyone at NASA Mission Control was nervously watching as their shiny new craft approached the Red Planet for an expensive mission. Costing over $800 million, Mars Observer was an orbital probe that promised to open a whole new era in Martian exploration. To map Planet 4 in ways that today seem quaint, but to 1993 folk were groundbreaking. Or rather, they would have been. Unfortunately, that fateful day, NASA lost contact with Mars Observer just 72 hours before orbital insertion. Despite whispered prayers, clever seeming solutions, and a whole lot of stress, the probe was never heard from again. Just like that, $800 million of taxpayer money had been flushed down a cosmic toilet. And that meant there was going to be hell to pay. The aftermath of the Mars Observer debacle saw NASA's biggest institutional shakeup since the Challenger disaster. Faced with an angry Congress in budget cutting mode, the space agency hastily implemented a new policy, on the went by the motto, faster, better, cheaper. That meant no more hyper expensive orbiters, instead, cheaper landing craft would spearhead the new phase of exploration, and none would be quite as celebrated as Pathfinder. The first soft landing on Mars since the 1976 Viking missions, Pathfinder was designed to do a whole bunch of groundbreaking science while also costing a quarter of the lost Mars Observer. For our story, though, the key is that the lander came with a bold little experiment attached to it, one that would pave the way for not just Opportunity, but scores of other missions to come. The name of that experiment? Sojourner. Weighing just 11.5 kilograms and little more than half a meter long, Sojourner was Opportunity's direct ancestor, a tiny, adorable little robot that ventured away from Pathfinder on a mission all of its own. Being the first Martian rover, Sojourner's baby steps were tentative at best. Over a lifespan of 83 Martian days known as Sols, it covered a mere 100 meters. But in doing so, it changed history. In the same way the Wright brothers' initial flight time of 12 seconds was both unimpressive sounding and an utter game changer, Sojourner's adventure opens a galaxy of possibilities. Unfortunately, those possibilities were soon put on ice by even more NASA budget cuts, which made a second Mars rover an unaffordable luxury. Thankfully, though, events would soon conspire to change the agency's mind. 
After 1993, 1999 is the other great year of NASA Martian screw-ups. In the space of three months, two probes, the Mars Climate Orbiter and the Mars Polar Lander, were lost or destroyed, in one case because of a humiliating mix-up between metric and imperial units. The death of the two probes put a temporary break on Martian exploration as NASA slammed the 2001 launch window shut to conduct a review. There would be no more Mars missions until 2003. For Steve Squares, Ray Arvidsson, and Larry Soderblom, this pause would turn out to be exactly what they needed. Scientists and former rivals, the three had spent the last decade pitching separate Mars projects to NASA, only to see them lose out to faster and cheaper options. Now, as faster, cheaper, better seemed to be dying, the trio began to put their rivalry aside. They began working instead on a team pitch. One might not be cheap, but would certainly be better. A pitch that would ultimately see them take the unofficial role of Opportunity's parents. It was the moment of the rover's conception, the spark that would soon light up the history of Mars. But not before Oppie underwent one of the most stressful and traumatic deliveries in history. You gotta hand it to NASA Administrator Daniel S. Golden. Although he initially balked at sending another costly rover to Mars, when he finally got the idea, he really got it. Looking over the plans for one rover, he asked and said, well, why not send two? That way they'd have built-in redundancy in case one went the way of the Mars Observer. It would also mean that they could land them on separate parts of the planet and study entirely different kinds of rock. From a mission viewpoint, it was an awesome suggestion. Squares and Arvidsson's whole pitch was that rovers would essentially be robot geologists, using their expert eye to tell us what orbiters never could. From a viewpoint of every single engineer at JPL, though, it was a sheer heart attack. The NASA green light came in mid-2000 with an immovable mid-2003 launch date. Squares & Co. had estimated that they'd need 48 months to build the rovers. NASA just gave them 34. And so began the most stressful three years of the engineering team's lives. For Opportunity and her sister rover Spirit, this was akin to their period of gestation. The robot equivalent of the nine months we humans spend chilling out inside the womb, absorbing nutrients, and making our mother's rue being heavily pregnant at the height of summer. And just like a human pregnancy, it was hell on the rest of the body. At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, work and opportunities hardware and software alike took place 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It was split between three 8-hour shifts. It was grueling. Not only were the twin rovers giant golf cart-sized things that weighed 185 kilograms each, they also needed to be equipped with all sorts of cameras and funky science experiments that Sojourner never had to worry about. The software, too, was a nightmare. Because of the time lag between sending a signal from Earth and receiving it on Mars, rovers on Planet 4 can't be steered in real time. That means they need to be capable of doing some stuff independently, which also means they're far more complex to program. In fact, Opportunity software was so complex that she was receiving patches right up until the moment of her birth, updates that were beamed across the gulf of space, even as she was already on her way to that remote and forbidding planet. Yet even amid the stress around her gestation, there was still time for some precious moments. Perhaps the most precious of all was the inclusion of a tiny bit of scrap metal within her body. Requested by part of the engineering team based in New York, that tiny piece of metal had been salvaged from the wreck of the Twin Towers, a twisted fragment of the buildings that were destroyed on 9-11. Including parts of it within Opportunity and Spirit was intended as a tribute to the families, to show that American spirit had not been crushed. Not that the rovers actually went by their names at this point. Like many unborn children, they'd not yet been named. Officially, NASA referred to them as MERA and MERB for Mars Exploration Rovers. Unlike most unborn children, though, it wouldn't be their parents that named the rovers, but rather a nine year old orphan from Siberia. In 2003, NASA launched a competition to name its new rovers. This being an innocent pre-social media time, the winner or wasn't Marzi McMarsface, but a short essay by the young adoptee Sophie Collis, who recalled how the distant stars outside her Russian orphanage's window made her feel less lonely. Now she wrote, In America, I can make all my dreams come true. Thank you for the spirit and the opportunity. The names became official in June that same year, just in time for takeoff. On July the 7th, 2003, a rocket blasted off from Cape Canaveral into the humid night sky on a 455 million kilometer journey. On board was Opportunity, traveling nearly a month behind her twin. Less than seven months later, the two would be on Mars. But only if they survived the journey. Because, as we're about to see, the official birth of these two rovers wasn't a time of great beauty 
or joy, but of nail biting stress. So here you are in the middle of an educational video on YouTube. I'm going to make what I think is a fairly safe bet that you rather like learning things. And if I'm right, I think you're going to love the sponsor of today's episode, Curiosity Stream. Look, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you know that we've covered a lot of military figures, lots of battles and wars. So I'd recommend you check out Apocalypse World War One on Curiosity Stream. It's made from over 300 hours of archival footage from World War One, and it traces the journeys of civilians and soldiers who fought for survival in one of the darkest times in history. It's a deep dive from the war's outbreak in 1914 to the US intervention and the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. If you like the stuff we publish here, you're going to love that show on Curiosity. Plus, you can watch Curiosity Stream pretty much anywhere, grab a few minutes on your phone or put it up on the big screen TV, whatever you like. It's also available worldwide so you can access their full library of content anywhere. And speaking of content, you're never going to run out because in addition to the thousands of programs already on their service, there's new shows being added every week. So, go to curiositystream.com slash biographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for you guys, use the promo code biographics and you'll save 25%, which comes out to only $14.99 a year. It's just $1.25 a month, which is super affordable. And now, back to today's episode. For a brief moment in early 2004, it looked like NASA might have another Mars Observer on their hands. On January the 4th, Spirit had landed in the Gusev crater, three weeks ahead of her sister. There, the first 18 souls had crept by without any problems. And then, Sol 19 began, and NASA lost all contact. In the agonizing days that followed, it had become clear that A, a software bug was to blame, and B, the still unborn opportunity likely suffered the same problem. Suddenly, it began to seem like 1993 or 99 all over again, like yet another mission was destined to bite the dust, leaving the combined $820 million spent on the rovers to evaporate into the orange Martian skies. But you already know that's not what happened. With perhaps the loudest exclamation of relief ever uttered by humans, the engineers were able to locate the issue and fix it. A patch was sent to Opportunity while she was still in space, and a scientific miscarriage was averted. And so we get to where our introduction began, with a streak of light shining like a crazy diamond over the Martian desert, a fireball that, on January the 25th, 2004, landed on Meridiani Planum. It wasn't exactly a gentle landing, though. Unlike the controlled descents later rovers like Curiosity would utilize, Opportunity came crashing to Earth inside a giant cocoon of airbags. 26 separate times it smacked into the planet's surface before bouncing back up and across the desert wastes. Finally, it came to a rest in Eagle Crater. Shortly after, a whirring could be heard, and at long, long last, Opportunity peered out onto the world that she had been born into. It was a world unlike anything anyone on Earth expected to see. At this point, you have to remember that there had been very few probes on Mars. The American landers that had taken pictures, Vikings 1 and 2 and Pathfinder, had all returned images that looked similar, of a barren landscape strewn by rocks. So when Opportunity peered out on a completely different terrain, all sand and craters and distant cliffs, it had been like seeing a brand new planet. A Mars that would be her home for the rest of her extremely short life. And yes, it was short. While we've been utilizing our opportunity as a living creature metaphor to talk about human things like gestation and birth, no one at NASA remotely expected their baby to last as long as any mammal. Instead, opportunity was designed to be something more like a mayfly, a rover that would hatch out of its cocoon of airbags and then live a mere 90 souls before expiring. The reason for this? All that Martian dust. Unlike today's nuclear-powered rovers, Opportunity and her sister were solar-powered. The expectation was that this would be fine for around 90 souls, at which point so much dust would collect on the panels that they'd stop working. That meant Oppie had to start her short life at a sprint and gather as much data as fast as possible. That's exactly what she did. Barely a newborn, the rover began examining a landing site and almost immediately turned science on its head. By analyzing tiny spheres of hematite, NASA dubbed blueberries, Opportunity discovered they'd been formed several billion years ago as liquid water flowed across them. It was the first direct evidence of liquid water once flowing across the surface of Mars, a major stepping stone for assessing if the planet was ever inhabitable. Sadly, the evidence at this stage was less that Mars had been a nurturing mother and more like a killer queen. 
The rocks Oppie examines could have only been formed by extremely acidic water. Still, it was a major achievement for the young rover, and was about to be followed by a far happier one. On April 4, 2004, something strange happened. That day, Spirit crossed the 90 sol mark, thereby outliving its expected lifespan. Less than a month later, Opportunity did otherwise. Now, that in itself wasn't super unusual. NASA intentionally lowballs mission lifespan so everyone's happy when its probes exceed them. What was unusual, though, was that Spirit and Opportunity then just kept on living and living and living. It turned out the Martian winds were stronger than anyone had realized. So strong, they periodically blasted all the accumulated dust off the rover's solar panels. In other words, Opportunity might be able to keep going for years. Even so, it would surprise everyone just how long the plucky little rover managed to live for. In many ways, the mid to late 2000s can be thought of as Opportunity's salad days, a time of life characterized by being young and carefree. As her controllers on Earth were swept along on the currents of ordinary life, through financial meltdowns and elections, past debt crises and austerity, Opportunity simply kept trundling along on Mars, following her simple, remarkable mission. She was just finding out as much about the Red Planet as possible. In this, she was helped immensely by her sibling. As Oppie was busy examining Endurance Crater and identifying the first meteorite ever found on Mars, on the other side of the planet, Spirit was making discoveries of her own. While Opportunity's landing site had been the jackpot in terms of science, Spirit had touched down in a place that everyone agreed looked remarkably boring. In fact, it looked so boring that it was only due to a massive fluke that the rover made her greatest discovery. On a drive through some loose dirt, Spirit developed a drag on one of her wheels. This wound up digging a small trench as she moved, which revealed the soil beneath was brighter. In fact, it was almost pure silica, and to be created in such quantities would almost certainly have involved water interacting with rock at a high temperature, such as around springs or hydrothermal vents. And that in turn provided yet more evidence of an ancient Mars that once appeared not red and dusty, but blue with seas. It's easy to forget now, but until Opportunity and Spirit arrived, we had no confirmation if our neighbor ever had liquid surface water. Their joint discoveries transformed our understanding of the early solar system, and they opened the door for a question that still haunts science exploration to this very day. Given evidence of ancient water, might Mars have once played host to alien life? This is serious philosophical stuff. Had the rovers now died after these two independent confirmations of liquid water in the distant past, uh, they would have been remembered as major successes. And that's fortunate, because dying is almost what they did. As much as we've romanticized Oppie's mission there, Mars is a hostile and unforgiving environment even for robots. In 2007, a massive dust storm picked up, enveloping the planet in a howling nightmare of near darkness. With the already faint sun reduced to a mist, smudge in an evil sky, Opportunity was barely able to get any juice from her solar panels. From an average of 700, her power dropped to only 128 watt-hours, a near-terminal decline that threatened to plunge her into eternal night. For six long weeks, Mission Control waited, like an anxious parent watching over a badly ill child, waiting to see if she'd pull back from the brink or simply fade away before their eyes. Finally, the storm abated. The surface of Mars grew calm once more. And there, on the windswept plain, she still stood. Opportunity, her solar panels clean enough to function, a journey far from over. Sadly, though, it would be a journey that she'd mostly make alone. While Spirit had likewise survived the mid-2007 dust storm, the rover's twin wouldn't be around much longer. On May the 1st, 2009, her wheels got stuck in soft soil on the edge of a plateau, leaving her unable to move. For nearly a year, NASA tried everything. Eventually, it was decided to use her like one of the agency's former landers, an immobile platform for conducting science in one place. All they had to do was tilt her solar panels slightly, so she'd get enough sunlight over the Martian winter. But even this, alas would prove to be too much. On March the 22nd, 2010, NASA lost contact with Spirit. Despite over a year of trying, the rover never again responded to any of their commands. Finally, on May the 25th, 2011, they announced the inevitable. Opportunity's sister was gone, now little more than a lifeless piece of metal, turning gold over half a world away. Oppie was now officially alone on Mars. After her twin's untimely death, Opportunity dealt with the loss in the same way that many humans do. 
She kept herself busy, setting off on a new mission to explore the 23-kilometer-wide Endeavor crater and its ancient rocks. Because the journey involved a long detour around a swath of soft sand, it would wind up taking three years. Three years in which Oppie would break the first of many records. On May 20, 2010, two months after Spirit stopped responding, Oppie completed the 116th day of her mission's seventh year. And that's an important number, because it's the length of time that Viking 1 had survived on the Martian surface, which meant that Opportunity was now the longest-running Mars surface mission in history. From a science standpoint, though, the most impressive moment came after the rover finally reached Endeavour in August 2011. Those ancient rocks that Crater held, turns out they were perhaps the oldest Mars rocks ever studied. And they too told what was by now becoming a familiar story. Formed by non-acidic running water some four billion years ago, the rocks confirmed that Mars was once home to rushing rivers, deltas, and churning seas, surface water that lasted perhaps 500 million years. It was another amazing find, more confirmation that Mars had once been conductive to life. Yet it was also perhaps the last gasp of opportunity as the cutting-edge science tool that should have been designed to be. Already the next generation was well on its way. On August 5, 2012, the first of that new generation arrived when Curiosity rover parachuted into Gale Crater, some 8,400 kilometers from Oppie. Within a decade, it would be joined by even more advanced pieces of kit, from NASA's Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter to China's Zurong rover. With these new arrivals came a subtle shift in the center of gravity. While Opportunity would keep making discoveries, she'd no longer be at the forefront. Instead, her fame would come to rest more on her incredible longevity. Not to mention, all the records broken. In May 2013, that included breaking the NASA record for distance covered on a celestial object, overtaking the 35.744 kilometers clocked in 1972 by the Apollo 17 lunar roving vehicle. A year later, in July 2014, she broke the overall distance record, snatching the crown away from the Soviet Union's Lunar Hod 2, which clocked 39 kilometers on the moon in 1973. By March 2015, she became the first human designed machine to finish a marathon on another world, crossing the 42.195 kilometer boundary. Yet, even as she pushed the bounds of human engineering to breaking point, there was no getting around one sadly obvious fact. The salad days, such as they were, were now long over, and Oppie was getting old. Like in a human, the signs of aging manifest themselves physically a joint that became stiff and wouldn't work properly, a wheel that could no longer steer. Eventually, even her memory started to go, commands would be forgotten, the robot equivalent of walking into a room one day and wondering to yourself, why am I here? Still, at least her longevity was at last bringing Oppie the recognition she'd always deserved. Back on Earth, the rover had become a celebrity. The cameras she'd come equipped with easily repurposed for the craze of posting selfies to social media. To be fair, she'd always been famous, though. By 2017, some of her operators could remember excitedly following news of her adventures back in 2004, when they were still in high school. But this was a whole new level. Oppie's age had turned her into a fundamental fact of life for millions. Come the late 2010s, she was like an elderly relative or a beloved pet, something you simply can't imagine not being around. But of course, even the longest-lived companion eventually dies. The old dog is taken to the vet one last time. The grandparent shuffles off to the great bingo hall in the sky. And now Oppie's time had finally come. In May of 2017, the rover began its final mission, investigating a gully on the edge of the giant Endeavour crater known as Perseverance Valley. NASA scientists were hoping to figure out if the gully had been carved by wind or running water. But they'd never get a definitive answer. In summer 2018, Oppie was beginning her descent into the crater when another Mars-wide dust storm blew up out of nowhere. Initially, the team on Earth weren't concerned. They'd ridden out the 2007 planetary storm without problems and, well, how could this one be worse than that? Well, it turned out the answer was rather easily. The 2018 dust storm was simply one of the greatest planet-wide storms to ever hit Mars. At the height of the 2007 storm, the sun had at least been a faint smudge in the sky. At the height of this one, it simply vanished. The whole planet was shrouded in darkness for weeks on end. And while Curiosity's nuclear battery meant that it would survive no problem, the same could have been said for the solar-powered Oppie. Initially, loss of contact with the rover was regarded as temporary. Even though her solar panels were undoubtedly covered with the dust, it was hoped that the strong martial winds that blow from November to January every year would clean her, as they had so many times before. There were few who thought this might really be the end. 
In early 2019, though, it became clear that the strong winds would fail to clean her panels this time. For weeks on end, NASA sent Oppie all sorts of commands, hoping to jolt her out of her slumber, hoping to give her one last burst of life. But it was not to be. On January the 25th, 2019, as American news sites were otherwise transfixed with a looming federal government shutdown, NASA sent its final signal to opportunity. She never responded. A couple of weeks later, on the evening of February the 12th, the grounds crew gathered in the control room for an impromptu wake. Someone played, I'll be seeing you by Billy Holiday. A few shed tears. The very next day, NASA announced Oppie's death to the world. And it was the end of an era. As many obituaries noted, the rover had been launched at an entirely different time, a time in which YouTube and smartphones hadn't yet existed, a world in which George W. Bush was president, Barack Obama was merely an Illinois hopeful running for the Senate, and Donald Trump had just launched a brand new show called The Apprentice, a world in which our knowledge of Mars had been a mere fraction of what it is now. Overall, Opportunity survived on the Martian surface for 5,111 sols, or 14 and a half years, and it covered 45.16 kilometers. Both of those remain records unbroken on the surface of any celestial body, and are likely to remain in place for a long time. But of course, Opportunity was always about more than simply breaking records. Before she and her sister touched down, Mars was a remote neighbor shrouded in mystery, a place we had briefly touched with three landers and had seen from orbit, but which we had yet to fully understand. Today, thanks to Oppie's pioneering work, Mars is almost familiar, a place whose vast, empty landscapes we can summon with the swipe of a finger, a place we plan to send yet more rovers to in the coming decade, a place that soon humans may set foot on. And when they finally do, opportunity will be waiting for them. With a landing site Meridiani plan of a possible target for future crewed mission, it may not be many decades before the first astronauts come face to face with a plucky little rover. And when they do, we can only hope that they take a minute to honor the robot that came before them, the rover that finally brought humanity face to face with Mars.